Is Pifu the new tofu? It would be nice if this cheap and accessible legume could be turned into a delicious, high-protein, low-carb, soy-free tofu alternative. Something you could cook multiple ways, throw into salads, toss into stir fries. Maybe, maybe not, but you'll find out soon. Hello, friends and not yet friends. Welcome back to Will It Tofu here on Mary's Test Kitchen, where we're taking a traditional tofu making method and applying it to non-traditional ingredients. Thanks to everyone who requested that we try peas, and especially yellow split peas, because this was by far one of the easiest ingredients to get. You can get these just about anywhere, affordably as well. I really appreciate the low cost requests. These yellow split peas were about five bucks for this bag, and I'm gonna use one pound dried, making whatever comes from this experiment worth about $2.50 Canadian. One pound is, of course, 454 grams. As for the other half of the bag, what should these peas turn into? Leave your suggestions if you have any. Then let's apply the traditional method of making tofu to these peas. Firstly, by hydrating them. But instead of my usual overnight cold soak to evenly hydrate them in a hands-off, casual, and relaxed but food-safe way, I'm adding hot water. This has just been boiled. A hot soak allows the split peas to plump up faster. They will be fully hydrated in about four hours. However, I can't speak to the food safety aspect. I don't really think I would be able to get away with this in a commercial kitchen setting, but at home, I'm living dangerously, my friends. To make this safer, we could have rinsed the peas off very well before hot soaking, but here we are. Four hours later, you can see the peas have become plump, and there's already some starch floating around in there. From our previous experience with red lentil and fava bean tofu, we already know we don't want that starch, at least in the tofu. Let's take it to the sink. After that vigorous rinse, let's see what we're left with. 841 grams of nicely hydrated yellow split peas. I'll have to blend half at a time, along with about double their current weight in water. First time around, I blend for about 20 seconds. Having recently been making hemp foo and pumpkin seed tofu, I was just kind of used to the shorter length of blending. Then I pour the puree through my favorite nut milk bag, Can you see my mistake? I can feel my mistake right away. This milk is so easy to strain. Too easy, in fact. The pulp comes out chunky. You can still see pieces of peas in there. What we want from the peas in the milk is still stuck in the peas. So back into the blender with some more water to blend for another 10 to 15 seconds. Through the bag again. The pulp comes out much better. Fine particles that are not so tiny that the milk became impossible to strain, but fine enough that we are pretty sure we got as much protein out of there as we could. This is gonna be almost pure fiber, and you can use it in other recipes like my Okara Sea Burgers. I'll probably incorporate it into a keto bread recipe in the future, but you can look up soy pulp recipes and use it the same way. Just make sure whatever you do with it, treat it as a raw product, which must be cooked before enjoying. Speaking of enjoying, let's blend the remaining peas with water. this time for a full 30 seconds in my high-speed blender. If you have a regular blender, like I used to have this Oster, you just want to blend it for longer. You do not need a Vitamix, but you will need probably a minute or more. You'll have to adjust the timing on your own, but use the pulp as your guide. When strained until no more milk will come out, the pulp will be like this. The particles are very fine, it clumps together when you squeeze it and holds its shape too. But you can also crumble it. It's basically all fiber. In the milk, we have our main concern of the day, the protein. This half of the milk has been sitting a while, 
and you can see this thick layer of starch already settled. So solidly, too. Are you curious about how much exactly? Well, what a coincidence, I am too. We have 68 grams, but there is a little water in there as well. But I know there's still more starch in this milk, so I let it sit. Usually I just let it sit for about 20 minutes, today an hour, because why not, I have the time. Then I remove the milk off the top, slowly with a ladle, trying not to disturb the starch layer below. And we do get a nice layer of starch, but less than what I know is ultimately in there, based on the nutrition facts. So this is when I'll answer your question. Why not let it sit longer? If 20 minutes is good, why not the whole day, overnight? You'll find out after this commercial break. It's the next day. We have milk, milk, and starch. Despite having sat for hours and hours, the starch in this milk is loose. In the middle of this pour, I'm seeing starch come out. I don't think you can quite see it on camera. I don't have a very good starch layer, not even close to the dense, thick layer we got in the bowls the day before. So to give this Pifu the absolute best chance possible, I'm pouring this back into the bowl and leaving it for an hour. Repeating this step to see if it will make a difference, so you don't have to. It's been an hour and I couldn't see, I can't see any layer of starch distinctly on the bottom there. I even lifted the bowl, I won't show you, but I even lifted the bowl to see the bottom and there was nothing. So I guess I have all the starch that can be settled out. I'm going back to the original technique. And so I don't find resting the milk overnight has any advantage over my usual 20 minutes to an hour. So finally, it's time to cook this beautiful pale yellow split pea milk. In our recent bean milk episodes, I cooked the milk on low in order to get the starch to gel up and strain out since the resting and settling technique did not work for those ingredients. I'm skipping that today and just trusting that we got most of the starch out with the settling techniques because by now I'm quite impatient to see some pifu, aren't you? So I get our pot of milk on high heat and stirring with my trusty flat-sided spatula so nothing will stick to the bottom. Also keeping track of the temperature with my handy laser thermometer, I want this to come to a simmer and then keep it there to cook the pea milk through. You don't really need a thermometer for this part really, by the way, because you'll be able to smell the fresh grassy rawness of the split peas, and this will gradually become a more familiar split pea soup type of smell. It's a bit nutty and warm, just a comforting aroma. Or it would if you don't cook by an open balcony door that is blowing in cold air and keeping the temperature low. Sorry, Chester, I'll have to close you out for now. Don't worry, with his heavy fur coat, he just loves it out there. And I am keeping an eye on him through the glass. Very soon, the milk is bubbling. It has similar characteristics to cooking soy milk. Residue builds up on the sides of the pot. If I don't stir constantly, it will stick and burn to the bottom. And there is a lot of foam, as you can see. If you're not careful with managing the heat, this can quickly bubble over and make a giant mess, so this is a real hands-on, paying attention kind of simmer. For about 10 minutes. Without any seasonings, it still smells so lovely, but I'm in a hurry to make tofu, so I forget to do the milk taste test. Sorry, my friends. It's actually hotter than we need right now, so I'm going to turn off the heat and get our coagulant ready. As usual, I'm using food grade gypsum, aka calcium sulfate, the traditional coagulant used in Chinese style tofu, among others, and a cup of room temperature water. 
It's my favorite Quaglin combo since it's completely tasteless and works reliably. Plus, it's very cheap. I'll link the gymsum in the description along with all my other favorite tofu making supplies. Also, as usual, I'm making double the amount that I would typically use for a batch of soy tofu of this size, just in case I need more. It's just a mineral in water, so if I don't use the whole thing, we can always save it in the fridge for another batch. And back to our pea milk. It's still a bit too hot, so I'll stir it until it cools to about 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that we're here, I'll stir up the quaglet mixture, which has settled, and proceed to pour it in slowly, just half the cup while stirring steadily to distribute the gypsum evenly. Now I stop the motion and quickly check the temperature, which is about 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Perfect. The perfect temperature for soy tofu coagulation. After the lid goes on and we wait about 15 minutes, we'll find out if it was the perfect temperature for split pea foo coagulation too. <laughs> All right, it is the moment of truth. This looks promising. You can see the clear way. Small curds coming through though. And very small curds, they're very fine, they're very wispy. I'm not seeing any additional milkiness, so we don't need to add any more coagulant. All right, let's get out my favorite tofu press. As always, this is my favorite tofu press. I will link it in the description if you wanna check it out. There are many different reasons why I love it mainly because it's easy to use. I'm going to need a cheese cloth from my bag of cheese cloths and nut milk bags. Um, the one that I bought, this one, I actually bought two of them and they both came with a cloth. Unfortunately, and I don't know why, it doesn't seem to be consistent. Some people are not getting cloths, some people are getting cloths. Um, so if you don't get a cloth, um, I also linked the cheesecloth that I recommend. It is All the City cheesecloth, grade 100. It comes with two pieces, or you can get like, I think you can get larger packs as well, but I think two is probably enough. Um, oh, as well as I'll mention my favorite nut milk bag. I've been through a couple of nut milk bags in the past. I used jelly bags in the past. I've used layers of cheesecloth, but I think this is the best. It's washable, it's strong, it lasts forever. In fact, I only bought this one because I lost my old nut milk bag and then when it finally came, I actually found my old nut milk bag, so I have an extra here. So, um, actually it's easier to keep this cloth in place if you moistened it, but um, I'm just gonna be lazy and hope everything turns out all right. Ooh. First step though, because the curds are so loose, I am going to do a intermediary step. Intermediate step, secondary step, I don't know. Primary step, free step. I'm gonna move the curds ever so gently away from the cloth so that the, the water can actually go through. Before I fill up this jar, have ourselves a little whey taste test. Oh, this is nice clear liquid. It kind of resembles a nice vegetable broth. Usually these are gonna taste pretty good. It's very plain. It's not as delicious tasting as many other broths. The good test would be to add some salt. Salt always brings out flavors. I only spilled a little into the tofu press. This lid on. It's got this spring inside, so as soon as I put the lid down, it adds pressure. And then I can twist this top and adds more pressure. And I twist it until it won't twist anymore. It will make this clicking sound. It's a pretty loud clicking sound. It's the sound of the spring passing a little plastic piece. So it, it is a kind of alarming the first time you do it and you think, oh, did I break it? No, it's supposed to do that. And then it will press out more of the whey, which we can just pour right out using these vents. And then just like with typical tofu, you wanna chill it completely. If you've seen one of my old videos, you might've seen me just 
press it for a little while and then take it out and put it in cold water. I just put this whole thing in the fridge. It chills completely through. I think it's a lot easier, less messy, and then it has the scale to see how much we've pressed it. We are at one and a half inches right now. We'll see how much that presses over time. All right, let's put this in the fridge. I'm gonna put it in overnight as usual, which you'll see in a second. Another day, another done. I mean, another beautiful day here in Calgary, Alberta, and we are going to be checking out that texture, checking out that taste of our yellow pea tofu, split pea tofu. But wait. There's more. I made another one. There might be a slight difference between the two. There might not be. They're both yellow split pea tofu. So I guess let's get on with it. First, let's just get these out on the table. Pop these off. This is the one you saw me make on camera. This is the one you didn't see me make. And I'll tell you the difference afterwards. First, we've got to Get these on a cutting board, unwrap them, this is the one we made together and this one is the one I made like last week. <laughs> so there's a bit of a color difference you can tell. I just left it in the fridge so I hope it's um, not gone bad. It smells fine. <laughs> Other than the obvious color difference, our week old Pifu is more compressed, drier to the touch. I wonder, is the darker yellow just because there's less water or is it something else? And is it safe to eat? Well, you're watching this video, which means I'm still alive, so that's something. I am particularly stoked about this particular tofu because it is First of all, made of peas, which is so accessible, inexpensive as well. Next, you got a nice firm texture. And if this one, the one I left in the fridge for a week, turns out okay and I don't have any stomach upset, then that's just nice for convenience sake. Let's take a look. Take a look at that texture. It's nice and firm. You know, what would be interesting is if we froze this and then um, saw the texture afterwards. But we don't have time for that today. Yeah, it tastes good. I mean, it tastes like yellow split pea. So if you like split pea soup, this is a good taste. It is more crumbly than your average firm tofu. Well, is it more crumbly or is it just as crumbly? I am stoked on this. Let's try the fresh one to see if there's any flavor difference. This one is strangely creamy, but also with a bit of a chalkiness to it. The taste is more neutral, more similar to regular style tofu. Then I tried them both side by side. I have to say, the aged yellow split pea tofu tastes better. It has more of that split pea taste, more distinct and more delicious. Now I'm not gonna sit here and recommend that you press your tofu for a week in the fridge because I can't know how food safe that is. However, I did eat this and I didn't get sick. <laughs> so there's something. But how does it hold up in cooking? What if I air fry it, pan fry it? Which one tastes better after cooking? Well, that's gotta be part two because this video is way too long. Thanks so much for hanging out to see if yellow split peas can tofu, which clearly they can. Please give this video a thumbs up if you liked it and comment all your serious suggestions in the comments below. Now I have to keep editing, so bye for now.